Welcome to episode 104 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Randy Wolverton, who served in the FBI for 28 years. During his bureau career, Wolverton, a CPA, worked cases involving violent crime, white collar crime, drugs, public corruption, domestic terrorism, and healthcare fraud. In this episode, Randy Wolverton reviews a savings and loan fraud case that targeted real estate investor Leonard Palullo. In spite of the testimony of LCN underboss Philip Leonetti, who admitted to brokering a disputed loan shark debt between Palullo and an LCN protected loan shark, the case had to be tried four times before Palulo's final conviction was upheld and he was sentenced to a 24-year prison term. Prior to retirement, Randy Wolverton was promoted to the Financial Crime Section Economic Crime Unit of FBI headquarters and was responsible for program management of corporate fraud, security fraud, insurance fraud, and mass marketing fraud matters. After he retired from the FBI, he co-edited a book entitled White Collar Crime, Core Concepts for Consultants and Expert Witnesses, published by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. Randy Wolverton currently continues to work for the FBI as a contract asset forfeiture investigator. This is an absolutely fascinating case. It's a white collar crime and an organized crime case all rolled into one. Can you imagine investigating a case that ends up having to go to trial four times? An investigation and trial ends up taking 10 years of your career until it's finally resolved? Well, that's what happened in this case. Now, before we get to that interview, there's just a few things that I want to tell you about. The first thing is go check out Pretend Radio. What's Pretend Radio? Well, it's a documentary style podcast about real people pretending to be someone else. And this week, I was interviewed on Pretend Radio. I was interviewed about my business to business telemarketing fraud case. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, I've heard that case review before. You're right. Episode 44 of FBI Retired Case File Review. But I'm telling you, you haven't heard the pretend radio version. Javier, the host, uses music and audio and weaves together a story of intrigue and suspense. I collaborated with him on this episode because I just love the way he takes true crime and creates psychological dramas, investigating and unraveling stories during each episode. I truly admire his creativity and you will too. So show Javier and Pretend Radio some love. Pretend Radio is available on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, and all of the other popular podcast apps. I also want to remind you that I will be part of a true crime podcast meetup, which will be held at Busboys and Poets, at 1025 5th Street, 5th and K in Washington, D.C. I will be joined by Esther, the host of Once Upon a Crime podcast, Deanna, the host of Twisted Philly podcast, and Haley, the host of Murder Road Trip podcast. The meetup will be held from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. I hope you can attend. I would love to meet you in person. No other big news. Just want to make sure you know you're always invited to join my reader team where once a month I send out an email digest with links to the previous month's podcast, crime fiction recommendations, and updates on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. I also keep you up to date on what I'm doing. If you're interested in joining my reader team, 
All you need to do is go to my website, jerrywilliams.com, and sign up when you see the pop-up, or go to my Facebook author page, Jerry Williams Author, and you'll see the sign-up button there. When you join my reader team, I'll send you the FBI Reading Resource, which is a list of books about the FBI, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs, books written by the very FBI agents that have appeared on this podcast. And the last thing, if you are enjoying the episodes, please don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts or follow on Spotify, our your favorite podcast app. At the end of the interview, stick around for the crime fiction update. Now here's the show. I'm excited to introduce my guest, Randy Wolverton. Hi, Randy. Hi, Jerry. Now, when I reached out to you and asked you to be a guest on the show, we were trying to decide what case you would review. And you told me about a case that on the surface sounds just like a typical savings and loan fraud case. But then you mentioned the mob, and then you mentioned that this case had to be tried four times. And I was sold. I said, yes, let's do this case. So give us a little uh, tease. Can you introduce the characters, tell us where this all took place, and then we'll get into the details. Uh, this case took place uh, when I was assigned to the Philadelphia Division of the FBI, and, and I had just been transferred to the Organized Crime Squad, Squad 1 in Philadelphia. And, and Squad 1 was responsible for working on the Nicodemo Scarfo Elsian family. And within that assignment, there were there were a lot of things going on at the time, which culminated in a large racketeering case, which uh, eventually took down the entire... LCN family, but there were there were um, spinoff investigations that were going on at the same time as the racketeering case was being investigated. And the case I'm going to talk about is one of those situations where uh, I was asked to uh, take a look at an LCN associate by the name of Leonard Palulo, um, and I remember very clearly my boss Klaus Rohr telling me he said, "Hey, rookie." Why don't you do a quick bank fraud case on this Leonard Palulo guy? So taking the bait, I started to jump into it, look at it, and what was intended to be a short, uh, quick-hitting bank fraud case to take out an LCN associate turned into about a 10-year affair, which I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, it, to me, it's a, it's a very interesting case. The, the lessons learned from that carry into present-day FBI, when we talk about investigative techniques and money laundering, following money, investigating uh, large-scale financial crime uh, type scenarios. So that's what uh, I've decided to talk about today, and hopefully others will find it interesting. Well, before you get started, what's your background? Do you have an accounting type background? I do. I was a police officer before I hired into the FBI in 1981, but I also had an accounting degree. And then actually, uh, during this investigation, I took and passed the uh, uniform CPA examination. So right right now, today, I'm a licensed CPA. I still do financial crime investigations. And, and my background in financial investigations actually started when I was assigned to the Philadelphia Division. Uh, around uh, 1983, when I was assigned to the White Collar Squad, where we investigated bank fraud, bankruptcy fraud, wire fraud type cases. Then I was transferred to the Organized Crime Squad in the Philadelphia Division. I actually was on that same squad, but I didn't get on that squad until uh, 1990, I think it was. Nin- yeah, 1990. So we missed each other. <laughs> we missed each other because that's when I actually transferred back to the Kansas City Division. That's uh, the original home for my wife and I. So we took our family back uh, back to the Midwest. But unfortunately, this, this case continued on, and I was working on this case while I was in my OP in the Kansas City Division, actually working in an RA. 
All right. Well, let's get started then. Uh, do you want to introduce the subjects and the players first? Okay. Uh, the main subject was a businessman by the name of uh, Leonard Palulo. And Mr. Palulo and his family had uh, um, been involved in various business enterprises over the years. Uh, he was a known LCN, La Cosa Nostra associate, which means that he was not a made member of the Nicodemus Scarfo LCN family, but he was considered to be an associate or quote-unquote with the family, which means that he operates under the family's knowledge and protection. And this becomes important as the case unfolds, as I'll explain. When I first started looking at the case, uh, Mr. Palulo had already developed a reputation of borrowing vast sums of money and defaulting on the loans, walking away from the loans, and becoming very um, aggressive against anybody who was actually starting to look at that, meaning the, the, the banking people uh, that he was dealing with. Uh, Mr. Palulo, although he would deny it, would actively trade on his association with the LCN family and take advantage of that aura and image in his uh, business dealings, which served to um, open some doors to him which may not have otherwise been open. So when I first started looking at the case, I started tracking his financial activities and seeing how many times he had borrowed money, how many times he had defaulted, and it was tens of millions of dollars. And he was very adept at forming a wide variety of different business ventures, uh, LLCs, uh, different company names. He, he uh, described himself as a workout specialist, which means he would come in and take over companies and uh, work through their debt problems and uh, try to put the companies on sound financial footing. When in reality, what he was doing was uh, t taking over companies, stripping them of their assets and putting them into bankruptcy and walking away from um, loan transactions with a wide variety of banking institutions. Now, at the time, uh, many of us will remember the savings and loan crisis. And the, the FBI hired people with accounting backgrounds to specifically look at savings and loan fraud cases and it just so happened that as I was working this case, this turned out to be one of the only savings and loan fraud investigations that was going on in the Philadelphia Division and at the U.S. Attorney's Office at the time. So um, as I first started looking at the case, you know, nobody was really too interested in what I was finding, which was a, a lending relationship between Mr. Palulo and his companies and the American Savings and Loan in Stockton, California. And I was tracking the money, I was showing the versions, and I'll explain that as we go along. And it generated very little interest in the U.S. Attorney's Office until the Savings and Loan crisis became a public fixture out of uh, Washington. Then all of a sudden the case became important. But what was always interesting to me was the the interaction between Mr. Palulo, these uh, lending transactions, and uh, the LCN family. So as I'm doing my research, um, I see a lot of uh, financial institutions who um, have defaulted loans on their books as a result of Mr. Palulo and his variety of companies. I even saw he was criminally charged in, um, I think it was the Northern District of uh, Ohio, with bribing a bank officer. And this case actually preceded the one I was doing, and it turns out he was indicted by a federal grand jury, taken to trial, and he was acquitted of all counts. And that seemed to embolden him and those uh, doing business with him to ramp up his activities. So what I decided to do was become more focused on probably what I viewed as the hottest topic in his business world at the time, and that was the renovation of six Art Deco hotels in South Miami Beach, Florida. Now, that area was had fallen into decay and disrepair over the years, but the Art Deco district was viewed as an up-and-coming area for developers. 
So Mr. Palullo was able to purchase six Art Deco hotels using financing from the American Savings and Loan Association in Stockton, California. And he engaged in a lending relationship with the American Savings and Loan, which we call construction draw uh, loan processes. And those of us who work white-collar crime cases over the years there should be familiar with the problems associated with construction draw type cases. So I began tracking money, and I tracked uh, loan money from the American Savings and Loan that were sent to the direction and control of Mr. Palullo as he was renovating these Art Deco hotels. And uh, the time frame for this was around 1985 and 1986. And at the end of 1986, the American Savings and Loan, through a lot of pressure they were receiving, actually discontinued the financing of these Art Deco hotel renovations because of concerns that the work wasn't being done. It was behind schedule. There were um, rumors of money being diverted. There were rumors of, uh, you know, uh, criminal elements moving into this area. It, and all these rumors were swirling around at the time. So while I'm beginning to focus on the financing of the renovations of the six Art Deco hotels, that was a small part of the big picture that the organized crime squad in Philadelphia was pulling together. So it, it was the job of this squad. It was led by Klaus Rohr to uh, prepare a racketeering case on the Scarfo LCN family. So all of us were, uh, that was our number one priority. What was the predication for you to start looking at Palula. What was it in their overall LCN investigation that brought him to the attention of the squad? Well, there were different things. We we, we had cooperating witnesses at the time um, who were not made members of the uh, Philadelphia LCN, but we also had a development that uh, was very, very significant. We actually had two made members of the Scarfo LCN, decide to become government witnesses, Nikki Caramondi and Thomas Del Giorno. Each of those situations have their own storyline, which is just fascinating. But all this is, is beginning to happen around 1986 and 1987. So as we're debriefing our confidential sources, our cooperating witnesses, while we're putting the racketeering case together, and we're debriefing uh, Caramondi and Del Giorno, we're getting a much better picture on who the big players were in the Scarfo LCN. So Mr. Palullo was uh, one of these people who were peripheral players that, uh, one of many who we decided to take a closer look at. And my assignment was to look at Mr. Palullo and try to uh, discern what his uh, financial activities were. Were they related to organized crime matters? If so, in what regard? And, and that was kind of the predication for what we were doing. Plus, we were hearing all these concerns from financial institutions of um, Mr. Palullo walking away from loans, taking over companies, stripping the assets out, defrauding the American Savings and Loan by diverting money. That information was in, in a nebulous type state, so it, uh, uh, my task was to put some clarity to that uh, situation. So what I was trained to do by some wonderful people that I worked with in Philadelphia who had great backgrounds in financial crime investigations, um, Chuck Reed, Sid Perry, Alton Sizemore, um, very, very amazing people. Unfortunately, I have to say I, I, I knew them well. Well, and, and Chuck, as, as you and I know, is on the martyr board for the FBI. And, and I could go on and on about the uh, wonderful nature of this man, but I had the privilege of working with him and, and other white-collar crime investigators that we all learn from each other on how to put these cases together. So when I was transferred to the organized crime squad, I think they were looking for me to uh, maybe take some initiative and add some clarity to the financial uh, dealings of the uh, Scarfo crime family and some of the associates. So I was I was tasked by my supervisor to take a closer look at this guy. So I decided to focus on these Art Deco hotels and the financing from the American Savings and Loan in Stockton, California. So while we're putting the racketeering case together, 
uh, I was involved in looking at that financial situation. And what that means is I was doing issuing more subpoenas than I was doing interviews because I'm gathering financial records. Once I get the financial records in, I would hand schedule those out. Then that would require tracking more wire transfers, tracking more financial transactions. I'd send out another wave of subpoenas. And when that information would come in, I would schedule those out. So I ended up looking at and scheduling over 100 different bank accounts that were used by Mr. Palullo. And because he had a, his nature was to open and reopen and reopen and reopen and open more uh, companies um, just by forming LLCs, and then he would get bank accounts. So he had a maze of companies that was made it very difficult for anybody to get a handle on what's going on. And, and that actually served to, to my benefit, even though it was a lot of work to subpoena these bank accounts and schedule out the records. It uh, it helped us to focus on you know the real hot spot, which at that time was the Art Deco hotels. To make a long story short, I was able to track the wire transfers coming in from the American Savings and Loan, schedule those out, and show precisely how Mr. Palullo was distributing the money. And what I found was he was diverting about half of the money coming in from the American Savings and Loans to personal projects. He was trying to open three restaurants in Philadelphia. He had a horse farm in Chester County, Pennsylvania, that was just absolutely amazing. He bought a piece of uh, property called the Pintler Creek Ranch in uh, Montana. And I'm tracking the money coming in from the American Savings and Loan. Part of the money would go to reconstruction of the six Art Deco hotels, but about half the money would be diverted to his own purposes and sent through a maze of different companies, LLCs, and different bank accounts. So it took a while to track all that out, but that's what I did. But that was only one part of it. You know, the, the question to me was, how was he justifying getting these construction draws from the American Savings and Loan? And what I found was that while there was some actual work being done on the Art Deco hotels, Mr. Palula was using his father's company as the uh, contractor for the renovation. Oh, Okay. And, and actually, Mr. Palullo's father was a very experienced and, and very skilled uh, person in, in that particular area. And some of the work that he did on the hotels was first rate. It was high quality, and, and there's no question the work was being done. But to unlock the money from the American Savings and Loan in the construction draw process, the, the weak point from the standpoint of the American Savings and Loan, they accepted as proof of work being done a one-page lien release from Mr. Palullo's father's company. What would normally be the appropriate documentation? Normally, the appropriate documentation are the actual receipts of goods and services being provided in a construction project. So you'd have receipts showing the purchase of materials. You would have the receipts showing the actual labor, who was working on it, how many hours, how much they're paid. And then you would see a lien release showing that that particular contractor had been had performed the work, had been paid, and they're releasing any liens that they may have against the um, against the project. So financial institutions want to see a complete trail of events to include a lien release before they release any more money. Unfortunately, what we saw was the American Savings and Loan was accepting handfuls and handfuls of single-page standardized language of a lien release, which only showed an amount that was handwritten in and the signature of Mr. Palullo's father. And they were using that as justification to release the next uh, wire transfer going out. And unfortunately, that allowed the opportunity for mischief. That was something that we had to overcome because that plays into Mr. Palullo's defenses, as, I, as I'll talk about when we get into the trials. But I could see right away that 
there's very little oversight from the American Savings and Loan in stock in California. They they eventually failed. That was the second largest failure of in the savings and loan scenario across the country. They had this was not their only bad loan. And you know, if if you look at that scenario, you could see why they got in trouble because you know, they had very little oversight into their construction projects flung all the way across the country in different locations. The Art Deco hotels were just one of many that went sour, but clearly um, they were not exercising a lot of oversight in what was going on in South Miami Beach, Florida, at those six Art Deco hotels. This became very significant in the trials because one of the defenses raised, once we started explaining to the jury what happened to the money, the money would come in, half of it would be diverted. One of the defenses raised was, well, Mr. Palullo had earned this money, so it was his to spend however he wanted. And uh, we were able to overcome and defeat that by showing the actual language in the draw request where Mr. Palullo was, was guaranteeing that when he received a wire transfer that he's assuring the lending institution that all the money he's received so far had been spent on the project intended and any money in the future that he gets is going to be spent on that project. So he was, he was really locked into that. Of course, he disregarded that and spent the money however he chose to do. So, you know, the, the initial case started off as just a diversion of loan proceeds. And, and, and I was able to track $6 million from the American Savings and Loan designated to the Art Deco Hotel project. And, and he diverted um, about half of that to his personal use, his personal travel, paying his personal credit cards, paying off debts, opening the, the three restaurants in Philadelphia, which none of them opened, but there were a lot, there was a lot of money put into those restaurants. And like I mentioned, the horse farm and then buying the ranch out in Montana, I could track all of that. So it was really uh, more of a financial institution fraud and wire fraud case. But towards the end of 1986, because the American Savings and Loan cut off the financing, and at that time, what I was doing was sending subpoenas all over the country to track down these businesses, track down the bank accounts, and schedule the account uh, proceeds. It was drying up his uh, sources of money. Unfortunately for him, and I didn't know this at the time, unfortunately for Mr. Palullo, what we found out later on from debriefing our LCN witnesses was he, he was in he was in a tough spot because he had borrowed two hundred fifty thousand dollars from a loan shark in Philadelphia who happened to be with the Scarfo crime family. And like all of his other laws, Mr. Palullo decided he wasn't gonna pay this. Well, the loan shark, Tony DeSalvo, said, Yes, you are gonna pay this. And, and couldn't get it resolved. So the resolution to that problem was actually brokered by Philip Leonetti and Nicodemo Scarfo. And the reason we know that was that after the racketeering case went to trial in 1988, convictions came back, and there were long prison sentences handed out to the various members of the Scarfo LCN to include 45 years in, in for uh, federal prison for the underboss, Philip Leonetti. Philip Leonetti went to jail. He wasn't very happy, so he decided to become a government witness. Philip Leonetti calls our FBI office, calls up uh, Jim Marr, and says, well, you know, um, I, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in jail. Come and get me. So that began, began a long debriefing process for an underboss of an LCN family, where we talked to him about a wide variety of things, but he starts to fill in details that we were not aware of. And, and the reason that's significant in the case I'm talking about is, is, is I'm tracking money. I know that Leonard Palullo had, had obtained and became the CEO of a publicly held corporation called Royale Group. And he put Royale Group, who which was an entity involved in the renovation of the Art Deco hotels. It was one of the borrowing entities. He put Royale Group in bankruptcy. That may not mean much to most people, but it means a lot to people like me, financial crime investigators, because 
once I found out the Royale Group filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, that's very meaningful because I know that Chapter 11 bankruptcy is a reorganization, which means that the Royale Group is going to have to file monthly reports on the money coming in and money going out. Those reports go right to the bankruptcy court. So that's one of the areas that I was reviewing. And and I saw uh, when Palulo's money was drying up, I knew he was getting uh, desperate and um, the the work on the Art Deco hotels had stopped. I saw a $114,000 transaction coming out of a Royal Group subsidiary account. I saw that in the bank records. So I go over to the bankruptcy filings, and I don't see where that uh, withdrawal was recorded like it should have been and needed to be in the Chapter 11 proceeding, because that Chapter 11 proceeding is overseen by the United States Bankruptcy Court System. So there are some very uh, explicit um, rules, regulations, and laws that govern that activity and, and severe consequences when that doesn't occur. So, you know, we look at things like that. So that $114,000 transaction, I tracked that through several different bank accounts where it's cashed out, it's given to Mr. Palulo's family members, and I kind of lose track of it after that because it's converted to cash, it's given to his brothers, and it just disappears. Well, um, that, that's a problem for me because I want to know what happened to that money, and that's a small part of the larger picture I was dealing with with the diversion of the savings and loan proceeds. But that became very meaningful when we started talking to Philip Leonetti because Philip Leonetti, the underboss of the family, tells us about the situation where he had to broker a settlement between Leonard Palullo and Tony DeSalvo for the unpaid loan sharking debt. And this occurred right at the time I was looking at this $114,000 transaction. And guess what? Philip Leonetti told us, The agreed-upon amount for the settlement was $114,000, and he said, "Uh, Lenny, you got to pay it. Bingo. (laughs) And and Palulo, unfortunately, his financing had dried up, so he had to go to this Royale Group subsidiary. It's one of the only places he could find some cash because when the LCN boss and the LCN underboss tell you to pay a debt, you know, it's it's not really a a request. And... um, they, they forced him to do it. So that that added clarity to the $114,000 transaction, which turned into a, a racketeering count in our eventual indictment that was a source of debate and fighting and argument and, and trial procedures. And that's one of the reasons why we had to go to trial four times over this. That one transaction was the linchpin for a racketeering case. So what the U.S. Attorney's Office did is they took the information that I was finding from following the loan proceeds, the diversion of the proceeds, turned that into, I should know precisely, it was 45 or 50 counts of wire fraud in in three different schemes to defraud the American Savings and Loan. The indictment was a little bit complex. But then they took those wire fraud counts and converted those to racketeering charges, and the $114,000 transaction was the initial piece for a racketeering case. So we filed the indictment in the um, right around 1989-1990 time period, and um, unfortunately, I was just transferring out to my OP at the time, so in my new assignment, I, I have you know, kept working on this case because um, Mr. Palullo was was not of a mindset to um, enter into any plea negotiations. He'd just come off of a victory in Ohio. He had had hired some very, very competent defense counsel who assured him that the government case was very weak and he could beat the case. And so there's a lot of drama involved. Hey, Randy, I, I just want to interrupt for a second for the listeners to let them know that OP means Office of Preference and to explain that once you get to a certain time in the Bureau that you can put your name on a list of an office that you would like to transfer to. When your name gets to the top of the list, then you get your Office of Preference transfer. So I just wanted to explain that, so please continue. 
Once I um, got my office of preference transfer, I, all of us in, in that situation hate to leave unfinished business, and that's what happened to me. So, you know, there was an obligation to finish this up. So we indict the case. Uh, Mr. Palullo is charged with a wide variety of wire fraud and racketeering counts. We have our first trial in the Eastern District of uh, Pennsylvania. And it was about a three-and-a-half-week uh, trial um, most of the the most lengthy testimony was mine, where I had to describe to the jury the flow of funds to American Savings and Loan, uh, how the lien releases work, how you know the actual work that was done, the diversion of money, and and, and that that was all okay. But as you can imagine, that that's kind of dry testimony. But the courtroom lit up when Philip Leonetti, the former underboss, came into the courtroom to testify about the uh, settlement between uh, the loan shark and Mr. Palullo. And it was, um, you know, the trial itself wasn't covered very much by the press, as you can imagine, but when Mr. Leonetti came in at that time in Philadelphia, any news about the LCN was big news. So the, the drama in the courtroom was very, very significant. And after the first trial, the jury came back and convicted on all counts. And I thought uh, that's probably the end of the case. Mr. Palullo was sentenced to 24 years in prison, lots of forfeiture, you know, the, the uh, horse farm in Chester County, Pennsylvania, the, the ranch in uh, Montana, lots of other assets were forfeited. But, um, but he appealed that, and um, unfortunately for us, you know, the, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals overturned all of the counts of conviction except for one, the, the count 54, which involved the $114,000 transaction. Reason being that the appeals court uh, ruled that the government did not introduce the bank records in, in the first case in a proper fashion. And we were all disappointed in that, understood that, and um, U.S. Attorney's Office decided immediately to retry the case. It's not uncommon with the, either a hung jury or um, in a situation where something is overturned on appeal. There's, it's very common to try the case again, which we did. What was the problem with the introduction of the financial evidence? The financial evidence um, does not qualify for, in, I'm not a lawyer, but in, in, um, in, in terms of getting it admitted into court, it does not qualify for the business record exception. And, What that means is before you introduce records from a business or financial institution, they have to be certified as being correct. Normally, there's a stipulation from both sides that bank records will come in. They're true and accurate records. They they reflect the transactions. Well, Mr. Palullo and his uh, initial attorneys and all of his attorneys that he used did not stipulate to anything. So the government, unfortunately, took the position that we think we can get the bank records entered without calling in a witness from each financial institution to testify that the records were uh, properly kept and so that they can be entered into as evidence. And uh, the trial judge ruled that uh, the government could do that because we're introducing records from maybe – uh, I'm going from memory here, maybe 20 to 30 different financial institutions from, you know, all of my work. And um, uh, the government wanted to uh, streamline the case, so the trial judge went along with that. Well, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals didn't. So they vacated the uh, conviction on all those counts except for except for one count. So then we have to schedule a second trial. And Mr. Palullo got a different set of uh, defense attorneys. And uh, defense attorneys from here on out were some of the best defense attorneys that I've ever seen in in my career. These are former AUSAs, former very accomplished AUSAs. They knew what they were doing. An AUSA is a federal prosecutor. Again, you know, for listeners who, who don't know that acronym. I'm glad you're correcting me because sometimes I assume people know more than uh, what they do. Uh, But the two defense attorneys, I thought, did a great job in offering a different uh, defense theory. And I I mentioned this briefly before. And what they said was, hey, look, uh, the FBI's got this all wrong. 
they're they're saying that Mr. Palullo diverted the money, but actually he earned the money from the American Savings and Loan each time he submitted a draw request. Therefore, he's free to spend the money however he wants. And that's where we really had to dig down in the weeds and show the actual loan documents where he's certifying that all the money received and all the money to be spent will be spent on those projects. That was heavily debated um, during the trial. The jury came back and convicted Mr. Palullo on all counts. And uh, again, the case was appealed. And, and the issue in the second trial was, uh, was Mr. Palullo, as a result of the first trial, was he now a convicted felon? Because, oh, because he had that one count, yeah. They had the one count. And before that, he was not a convicted felon. So the, the, this was debated with the trial judge. The trial judge says, uh, yeah, you know, he's treated as a, you can treat him as a convicted felon. And, and uh, Mr. Palullo in the first trial got on the stand and testified. In the second trial, he got on the stand and, and I think as memory is he, he testified. And the big debate was, you know, was he a convicted felon or not? And the jury came back and convicted him of all counts, and and then they appealed it. And the Third Circuit Court of Appeals says, "Nope, government, you got it wrong again." And um, that that was an unfair uh, position to take. I think the, the the legal term is collateral estoppel. I, I know I read all the appeals, and uh, it became you know very grainy type legal arguments that are that are very important. And uh, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the trial judge was incorrect. They vacated the convictions again. And then the U.S. Attorney's Office is faced with, uh, well, what do we do now? So they said, well, we're going to try it again. So we did. Same witnesses, uh, same evidence. Um, and uh, in, in this particular case, I remember very clearly there was there was one juror who dropped out. So we had 11 jurors. And they came back after the uh, testimony with a hung jury. It was uh, 10 to 1 for a conviction. We had one holdout. Wow. So, <laughs> so then the decision is made, well, we're going to do it again. So we, we go into the fourth trial. And each of these trials, how long are they taking? How about many days? Uh, three, about three or three and a half weeks of trial time. And uh, with each trial, uh, I know I was on the stand about uh, – Two and a half days, maybe three days, a long, grueling testimony. But you know, I'm the one who traced all the money, so it, it, um, it, it was just uh, very memorable. And I was cross-examined each time by different defense attorneys who were very, very skilled and had access to. For all the witnesses, including myself, they would have access to testimony from the previous one or two trials. So a lot of the time in cross-examination was spent in trying to point out inconsistencies between, you know, the, the different uh, times of testimony. <laughs> so it was very difficult, uh, not just for me, but for all the just, – just the lay people coming in to testify. And, you know, they're having to face this kind of cross-examination. It was, it was very unpleasant. So by the fourth time, they were real unhappy. And uh, we, we did try the case for the fourth time. The jury came back and convicted, and um, there were appeals made. There were the, there were findings of uh, – there was a Brady violation that was found against the – directed against the U.S. Attorney's Office. There were all kinds of challenges to the case, and the, the Third Circuit finally held up uh, most of the um, uh, convicted counts in – then Mr. Palullo was his sentence of 24 years was upheld, and he eventually went to prison. And um, that that led into some other cases that I'll that I'll mention briefly. But um, it was such an ordeal for um, all the witnesses in this case: the civilian witnesses, the bank witnesses, the uh, people we had to call from Florida to actually have to do this four times. So we convinced. Um, 46 out of 47 jurors, and uh, the trial judge was, uh, you know, convinced that uh, everything was done properly. We just couldn't get couldn't get things through the Third Circuit, and and that's a testament to the skill level of the uh, defense attorneys and the the um, attorney they hired to uh, write the appeals. He ended up being a counsel to I mean, one of the White House administrations. I mean, he was so well regarded 
in the legal profession, and he was he was very very good. He and I would not be considered friends in any way, shape, or way, but I do have a grudging respect for his uh, legal. <laughs> So after Mr. Palullo is finally convicted the fourth time and the conviction is upheld, that, that those weren't the end of his legal problems. Uh, he was actually indicted in the, by U.S. Uh, um, District Court in in uh, New Jersey, I think the Northern District in New Jersey, for defrauding a small printing company. Compton Press was an internet printing company, and that that's very significant to me for a different reason, but... He was actually charged with taking over that company. They brought him in as a workout specialist. He drained the assets. He, he stripped the assets from the pension fund, leaving um, all the employees from this small printing company without their, their pensions. So he was actually charged, and, and indicted and charged, arrested, and tried and convicted for that case. And then while my investigation was going on, the four different trials, he was actually able to be brought in to a, a nationwide trucking company as a workout specialist to rehabilitate that company. PIE Trucking was the name of that company. Very large trucking company, and he did the same thing. He stripped the assets out, put the company in bankruptcy. But he was a pretty unpopular guy. Was he doing this at that time in order to finance his defense on your case? Well, we didn't know it at the time, but uh, that that's what happened. Now, I didn't know this until I started reading about the Compton Press case in New Jersey, but he was actually using some of the proceeds to pay his defense counsel in our case because, you know, these high-powered defense attorneys are expensive. And these were not public defenders, so he was paying them vast sums of money. So he was getting the money from someplace, and now we know how that happened. I remember, though, after the first trial, one of the things that clearly stands out is there was a gentleman that came up to me after the trial, he'd been in, in, in trial almost every day watching. And he shook my hand and he had tears in his eyes. He said, you know, I just lost my pension to this guy. I work for Compton Press in uh, New Jersey. And what you guys did it is so important to bring this man to justice. Now, I know I'm not going to get my pension money back, but I needed to see him convicted. So as FBI agents, you know, we don't always get a chance to interact with with collateral victims like that. But but he just touched me. It's something I'll, I'll never forget. And that lesson is carried over in the future cases that I work because in financial crime cases, we oftentimes see that it's the little guy who's harmed. You know, in our big corporate fraud cases where pension funds are depleted and you know, the, the stock becomes valueless. Those, those end up being real victims, and, and I saw that firsthand in this case. So while this started off as being maybe more of a routine financial institution fraud investigation, it turned out to be linked to the Philadelphia LCN family. There were, you know, just, just one transaction that kind of put that together, but we had to use testimony from... Um, you know, a cooperating witness, Philip Leonetti, it, it added a lot of uh, drama to the case, and it turned out to be something a little bit bigger than what I thought it would when I first was challenged by my supervisor to do a quick-hitting bank fraud case on uh, Leonard Palullo. That is just absolutely fascinating, and the tenacity of the prosecution team, which, of course, includes uh, you and, and any other agents that were involved in the investigation, it's just unbelievable to have to retry a successful trial three more times in order to finally get the subject some time. Well, everybody, everybody was left with battle scars, myself included, and lots of good learning lessons. And well, I, I don't think you find too many cases where something is tried four times, but th that would illustrate the, the financial menace that this um, Leonard Palullo created over the years, and that resulted in determination from a lot of people, not just myself, but, you know, our colleagues at the U.S. Attorney's Office to hold this, this man accountable for a wide-ranging uh, uh, fraudulent activity. So that's, that's really his fault. That, that falls on him for being so blatant in his fraudulent schemes and so combative 
you know, in his other trials, his method of operation was to attack the government and attack the investigators and hire attorneys who would do that. So I know I went through that for the first time, certainly not the last time, but the first time. And that was his method of operation in all of his other legal proceedings, too, is, is lash out at the government, find, uh, you know, whatever legal procedure you can to throw into the appeals. And, and of course, he's not the only one who does that, but but uh, he was very, very good at it. And if you were to talk to him today, uh, and, and I haven't, I, I expect you would find him unremorseful, and I expect you would find him in, him combative and willing to do the same thing all over again. When I worked these type of cases, I think that was the most interesting thing and the challenge because these perpetrators always believe that they're the smartest person in the room, and they really can't believe that you're going to have the audacity to go after them. Well, I know from working LCN cases, uh, they don't roll over on anything. They're going to make you prove everything. There's no stipulations in the trials. They're going to engage every opportunity to intimidate witnesses, attack the government witnesses, uh, uh, ridicule the FBI agents. It's just the nature of the game, and it, it's uh, it's not for the timid, and that's for sure. You know, we all come out with you know battle scars. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Fascinating time for me. I believe that because even though you retired from the FBI, you're still doing financial investigations as a contractor. I am. And um, fortunately, I get a chance to work with uh, young FBI agents and actually young forensic accountants. It, at that time in the FBI when I was doing this case, we didn't have what we call forensic accountants. That's the stuff that I did. That's the stuff that agents like me did. And since that time, we've been able to stand up a forensic accounting unit where we actually hire highly skilled accountants to come in and work as not agents, but work in the background as forensic accountants to do what I did. So the lessons that we learn from these kind of cases, how to track money, how to schedule transactions, how to follow money through the accounts, how to identify money laundering, what we were doing in the 1980s are the lessons that are being taught today. So... Even though these are tough cases, we all learn things from them, and that becomes part of our DNA that uh, people like you and me try to pass along to uh, the new agents coming in. Well, Randy, you seem to have so much knowledge about working these types of cases. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Well, yes. Uh, I, I was challenged uh, one time to um, write a book about some of the instruction modules that I put together over the years as I would reach out to the business community and I'd actually been doing a lot of work for the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and through those connections, like I mentioned, I was challenged to put together a book on um, some of these experiences. So that's what I did. I um, uh, teamed up with another CPA and, and we wrote a book called uh, White Collar Crime Core Concepts for Consultants and Expert Witnesses. And it was published by the AICPA, and there might even still be a few copies floating around. I don't know. You won't find it on the New York Times bestseller list. I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> but you have to really like white collar crime to read stuff like that, I guess. I would describe it as a labor of love. It's just something that I enjoyed putting together. What I like to do is give my guests the last word. So, what would you like to say? You can sum up your career, you can sum up this case, what would you like to say? I, I think what I want to say is how important the DNA of the FBI is and, and how important it is for the onboard agents to savor that, to cultivate that, to improve it, and to pass it along to the new people coming in. It, as long as we hire good people, I think we can get them trained to do what it is that needs to be done to protect the country. But uh, learning that FBI DNA of doing things the right way and to make sure that those lessons are passed along to the next generation. You know, just as a, as a quick example, the lessons I learned in this case, when I moved back to the Kansas City Division for my office of preference, in 1995, the uh, Murrah Federal Building was bombed in Oklahoma City. Well, it was the lessons learned from cases like this, from, from me and other agents from around the country who'd worked these kind of very difficult cases, we were tasked to pull together that investigation. 
and without going into a lot of details, the lessons we learned about the thoroughness, the aggressiveness, the doing things the right way, the doing things the legal way, and to to challenge each other and to challenge the evidence, that all came together in the Oklahoma City bombing case. And there's probably hundreds of other cases where I could say the same thing. But but those lessons from these cases are critically important to remember and to pass along to younger folks coming into the FBI so that they can pass it along. Because their challenges today are to defeat terrorist organizations who don't play by the rules. But the, the lessons that we learn from these cases are still very valuable in that, uh, in that arena. And that's the end of the interview. Back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Randy Wolverton and newspaper articles about the Leonard Palulu Savings Alone case and trial. I hope you share this episode with your friends, family, and associates. Social media share buttons are at the bottom of this episode's show notes. And if you're listening to this on a podcast app, you can share it directly from your device. And could you do me a favor? Could you subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review so that episodes show up magically on your device every week? Now's the time for the crime fiction recommendation. And as you know, I have been steadily reading Natchez Burning by Greg Isles for the last few weeks. Because when I started the book, I had no idea that it was 865 pages long. I enjoyed the book, but I did think that it was too long. But it was good, and I highly recommend that if you have the time to read 865 pages, that you devote it to Natchez Burning. This book is actually a part of an epic trilogy. The main plot involves several violent, vicious Ku Klux Klan murders of black men in the 1960s and the determination of a local reporter with the help of Penn Cage to reopen and finally solve those murders in present time. You know how positively loyal I am to the FBI And there were some remarks during this book that indicated that the FBI had not done all that it could to look into these old Ku Klux Klan murders. So I wasn't happy about that. But the book is good, well written, with rich prose and developed characters. So my crime fiction recommendation for this week is Natchez Burning by Greg Isles. And when you're over at Amazon.com checking out Natchez Burning, I hope you'll also check out my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play, about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. Pay to Play is available as an ebook, trade, paperback, and audiobook. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.